What are you expecting tonight, David? <laughs> what am I expecting? I'm not sure what I'm expecting. I will be, because Hugh, every time I expect something over the last 10 years, that you know, these politicians seem to zig or zag. But, uh, you know, I will say that, uh, you know, Harris has a lot of work to do to navigate past policy positions and to explain why she has changed her mind as her campaign and, and her have said she's changed her mind on a number of key issues. Uh, the former president, of course, has to navigate his personality. When he can keep the focus on policy, he's in a much better position. He often cannot do that. Uh, in his first debate with Joe Biden in 2020, uh, he was focused on personality and, you know, he acted like Joe Biden had no business being on the debate stage with him, couldn't keep the focus on policy, and it really hurt his campaign. Obviously, June 27th of this year, a completely different story. So which Donald Trump will show up and will Kamala Harris be able to, to talk about policy in a way that gives confidence to a lot of voters who are open to voting for her, as the polls show us, uh, but are not yet sure that they have confidence in, in her ability when it comes to issues. You know, I was listening to the commentary podcast yesterday, David, and John Podhortz made a fascinating and I think very true observation. Incumbent presidents running for re-election have blown their first debates since 1980 when Jimmy Carter did it, 1984 when uh, Ronald Reagan did it, 1992 when George H.W. Bush looked at his watch, and uh, not only Obama in 2012 and Trump in 2020. Those incumbent presidents, for some reason, incumbent presidents don't, maybe they overprepare, maybe they've been in the situation room. Uh, Kamala Harris, not an incumbent president tonight. My column for Fox News says the pressure's on ABC not to end up being Bud Light at the end of this. What, do you, what is your expectation for ABC and its parent company, Disney? Because the stakes are pretty high with Red America. Yeah, look, I, I, I mean, the, the stakes for, you know, the media industry, it's, it's, a, it's a different story. There were a lot of doubts about how CNN would handle the Biden-Trump debate, and every, you know, most people, including the Trump campaign, were satisfied with Dana Bash and Jake Tapper. And so it'll be interesting to see if David Muir and, and his colleague um, can handle uh, this debate Lindsay, in a yeah. similar fashion. I don't know much yeah. about Lindsay yeah. at all. Lin there's I know, no and, Lindsay. And yeah. Well, listen, she's, <laughs> I'm in the media and I'm forgetting her last name, and that's just my failing here. Um, Davis, I think. But uh, correct, thank you. However, let's remind ourselves that, you know, whatever Red America and Blue America thinks about this debate, and they both complain about the media, just with, they have different reasons for complaining. It, it really matters in the seven swing states. I mean, that's what matters. Do the people tune in? Do they get something out of the debate? Do they think it was fair? Um, and, and even then, it really then just gets down to the, to the small but significant number of persuadable voters and, and actual swing voters. Now, I believe that polls in one place, John Ellis, showed up yesterday and told me, look, the average of the average of the averages is that it's tied everywhere, not just nationally, but in the swing states, but that there is, as Pew Research has confirmed, a polling response bias. There are some groups, demographics, that over-respond to polls. So I think Trump is ahead, but he can lose that lead. If he blows it tonight, I don't think there's going to be a second debate, by the way. I just don't. Do you think there's going to be a second debate? Well, there'll be a second debate if, if the candidates feel that they need it. And if one or the other feels like maybe they can get away without it, but feels pressured to do it, uh, you know, for political reasons. So I'm kind of up in the, I'm, I don't, I'm not disagreeing with you per se, but I could see a scenario where one or the other decides that they need it. They start bringing the pressure and then the other one relents. I, I think the only person who would do that would be Kamala. And if she begins to demand a debate, we will know that she, the polls have fallen through the floor. Uh, that's my view on that. I am interested. I have all my questions over at foxnews.com, David. But one I, I wanted to ask, do you think it would leg be legit to ask each candidate what they think of the other's running mate? Yeah, I mean, that's a legitimate question, sure. Because uh, I think J.D. is doing a fine job. I hope he stays away from Tucker and the nutty historian. But I also think Tim Walls has really not been what they needed. What's your assessment of Walls? Well, I, I think that Walls has provided them uh, what they need in certain respects. And look, look in, in other respects, 
Um, there have been been some turbulence, but I, you know, I can say the same for J.D. Vance. Look, if if Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris has been the one in the, on this ticket that has uh, tried to move to the center or has attempt is attempting to move to the center, and when you're attempting to move to the center as the principal, then you, you often may pick a running mate who shores up concerns from the base. Um, had Kamala Harris kind of position wide stayed where she was in 2019. Then you pick a Josh Shapiro, someone seen as a centrist, but to signal the voters. Hey, she, she's regretting that every day. I got a quick exit quiz for you. Who was Michael Dukakis's running mate, David Drucker? Lloyd Benson. Lloyd Benson, you win for 100. Vice presidential people that we never hear from again for 100. David Drucker got it. Thank you, Drucker. David M. Drucker on X. When with the dispatch, I'm coming back with Byron York. Stay tuned, America. <laughs> 